welcome back to an episode of the Cooler Jets podcast. We're Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Michael, we are back. The first week of training camps is in the book. And as soon as I got back into cell reception, I've, I've been out of it for a few days. Uh, I came back yesterday uh, and my phone was just blowing up with uh, tweet notifications from all the practices. And I just got to see all the different overreactions over the last few days. Um, and I have to say, it does sound like, and you tell me if this is right or wrong, uh, that the first week of training camp, pretty successful one. What would you say? I definitely think that would be an accurate way to put it. I mean, as successful as training camp can go, because I mean, you know, there are a few boxes that I think you're looking to check. I think you want to see competitive football between both the offense and the defense. You don't want to see one side too dominant over the other on a consistent basis. I think we got that. There's definitely been quite a bit of positive from both sides. Maybe the defense takes a little bit of an edge, but both sides have definitely had their turn in the spotlight. Um, and then uh, I don't even want to say it because I don't want to jinx it. But look, to this point, injuries, no, don't say it. Don't we, everybody knows. I'm, I'm everybody knows. It. It. I'm going to say no. it. We got, we got to speak God. the facts. We got to speak I'm the facts. I'm not going to wood. It's, that was wood. I, there's no wood within my vicinity right now. Oh, but gee, I'm, I'm going to do out. it. I'll Knock talk. it on, on the air. Um, but the injuries have been good so far. Hopefully okay. I'm not jinxing it. But okay. they've even got guys coming back. George Fant. Jeremy Rucker, Tevin Coleman. So um, then quarterback obviously is important. And I think you've seen progress with Zach Wilson, especially these past couple of padded practices on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, especially Wednesday where he was perfect um, throughout team drills. So um, it's, it's been a good training camp so far. I think as far as training camps go, it's definitely been on the positive end of the spectrum. So hopefully that all the things we just talked about uh, will continue. Well, look, I mean, the injuries will hit. It's normal. It's football. It's contact sport. I think all you're just looking to, to see is just none of those, you know, injuries that just take the air out of the balloon of the season uh, like they had last year. They lose guys to sprained ankles and hamstrings and whatnot. Those are normal. You're just looking to, to make it through camp as safe as possible. And it does seem like they've taken some measures. I mean, clearly they had a slow ramp up period during OTAs. And maybe this is just me. Uh, and granted, I haven't been, you know, around for the live part of the, the, the practices. I've just kind of read the, the tweets in retrospect. It seems like the practices are a little short. If I'm being, it seems like they stretch for most of it. They do some light seven on sevens, you know, some positional drills. Then they do the 11 on 11s, practice it over. Um, I don't know. It's, it seems like, you know, they, they have spent so much money on their performance staff and trying to figure out why have they had so many injuries the last few years. Um, that They put a lot of work into it. One weekend, as you said, it went well. Injuries will hit. It's normal. It's part of the game. But um, you know, just got to knock on wood and, and, and you hope you can it continue that luck. Uh, I think you had an article in Jets X Factor. I haven't read it. You were telling me about it, but how we should react to training camp. Because as you said, I mean, look, every single pass that Zach Wilson has will be scrutinized and analyzed. And if the fans are there, it'll be filmed. And if it's a good pass, it'll be praised. And if it's a bad pass, it'll be posted by Dolphins Twitter. Um, and so you, you have to take everything in perspective. Yeah. When you see training camp practices, what are you looking for? What defines a successful training camp uh, to you? Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion. And, and it's one we have every single year, um, you know, from an outsider perspective um, of someone who's not in pra at practice every single day. And, and even for those who are, um, it's, it's a tough sort of puzzle to try to solve in terms of how do we evaluate these practices? Because obviously they have value to some extent. But there also is a limitation to the value that they have or else every single year, all these training camp superstars would translate that to the regular season, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, so it is sort of tough when you're kind of watching these tweets roll in the play-by-play, the -play, you know, Zach Wilson completes a pass, Zach Wilson throws a pass, you know, misses behind a guy or, you know, Sauce Gardner makes a pass deflection. Now Sauce Gardner's beat, you know, you're seeing all these, you know, play-by-play -play descriptions roll in and it's like what do I put value into what doesn't matter um, if a guy's playing well how much should I value that if he's struggling how much does that matter um, it's always tough but I think the biggest thing that I usually try to look out for is to just let it all play out let the practices roll in and look for consistent trends I think that's the main thing that you want to look out for if someone is playing really well consistently then it's probably a good sign. You look at Elijah Moore last year, who was the star of camp day in, day out. 
And that translated to the regular season. He definitely carried that over. And then you look at the opposite end of the spectrum. One guy who was consistently not in the news for a positive reason was Denzel Mims. And, you know, part of it was injury and the food poisoning. But, you know, there's also reports he's struggling to pick up the playbook. He's falling down the depth chart. Um, And a lot of fans scoffed at it while it was happening. But it turned out to be a very accurate um, example of what was going to happen during the regular season. So I think consistency is what you're looking for. You know, Zach Wilson had a great practice yesterday. He's had some up and down practices. Um, But on the whole, I think you look at his body of work so far, he hasn't had any disastrous practices. And, you know, you take the – that's very good. I don't have the wood within my vicinity, like I said, so I need you to take care of the wood knocking. Um, I think we're doing a good job of that so far. But with Zach Wilson, you you look at the body of work so far, he's had some of those, you know, up and down practices, but he hasn't really had any bad ones, and he's definitely had a few good ones. So I think overall it does kind of trend on the positive – side of things and I think that is a positive for him and and so I think that's what you want to look for is you know don't overreact to one bad practice or one great practice just let's let it all play out and if a guy is consistently great then that's something to be excited about if a guy is consistently really bad then definitely you should be worried about that um, but on a day-to-day I think you want to try to you know keep it measured but just try to look for trends that uh, develop over time. Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, and consistency is certainly key. And I think, you know, you mentioned Zach um, stacking back-to-back good days. If he can put together multiple days in a row like he had yesterday, and we're recording it Wednesday, so today and on, on Tuesday, um, you know, if he can put together three straight practices like that, four straight practices like that, and he can build that momentum, not only does that build his own confidence in his, in his play and his teammates' confidence and the fan base's confidence, but I think that gives you – that takes I think some of the pressure off of the early season performance at least in my eyes and obviously training camp isn't the the end-all be-all but if he is up and down in training camp and we really don't haven't seen that consistency and then it's kind of the same in preseason then week one rolls around they have such a tough stretch to open up the year and if he struggles you know I just feel like that pressure is just built up so much throughout the offseason and training camp that it's just willing to bubble over and the, the fan base will lose patience and you know, so much of being a quarterback in the league is, is your confidence. And if he's able to stack together some consistent days in training camp and really flash, it doesn't mean he's going to be an amazing quarterback in the league. No, but like you said with Elijah Moore and like with Denzel Mims, you know, it can give you a sneak peek of what's to come. And so you can't overreact to one good day or hell, even two good days in a row. But if you can look at the whole body work training camp and say, you know what, he didn't have many, if at, if any, disastrous practices he's he put together a lot of good days and he even had a few days where he looked really special I think that's what you're looking to see and I think we can hop into that right now because Zach is is the thing that I think for most fans they're most interested in in training camp practices we have excuse me we have a ton of notes um on kind of the all our thoughts from the first week and as we said it's you know it's hard to analyze especially when you're not at the practices every day um but believe me we we did uh, put together some content here, but I guess we should start with Zach. Uh, after that, we have some of our thoughts, our winners and losers and, you know, losers in training camp, especially after one week, it's, it's kind of a hard list to come up with because you don't really know. Um, sometimes a loser can be somebody who's just not doing anything and it's hard to put them in the loser category because you haven't heard anything about them. Um, and then we have a few other debates and, and then I think we'll get out of here, but let's start with Zach. Um, <clears throat> you kind of touched on, on your initial thoughts on, on his performances you know, specifically, uh, it seems like he's more decisive. At least that's the sense I'm getting from the beat reporters. And like we said, we're not there. Um, but when you watch him and on Saturday's green, white scrimmage, there'll be a lot of film that'll be able that, that fans will be able to see. I mean, what are you looking for in, in seeing in his plays on in scrimmages and in practices that might be different than what we saw last year at this point, or even in the games? I mean, every play, I, I think a lot of people, and you've heard LaFleur talk about this, that hitch, um, you know, it's like they take a three-step drop, they go one, two, three, and then they pause. And when they pause, it throws off the entire timing of the offense because it's such a timing-based offense. Uh, that's one of the things for me personally, when I watch any of those uh, plays that that fans have recorded, I'm looking to see, do we see that hitch? And like, look, obviously you're going to have some sort of pause to, to go through your reads. But if you see Zach, you know, pausing for one second and two seconds, then you know it's a bad play. And in a real-life situation could even be a sack. 
Um, outside of that, or maybe you, you can expand upon that. What are some of the things that you can take away from, from Zach's performances and going deeper into his first week? What have you liked? And, and is there anything you, you've seen that or heard that you didn't like? Well, that's a really good point. I think on the, on the timing of the dropbacks. And, and I think that really highlights kind of the main thing they want to do not just with quarterback but with any position in training camp is to try and look at the process of how they're doing things and the fundamentals of how they're doing things because you know the result is the result you know sometimes a 50 50 ball is going to be caught by the receiver sometimes it's going to be broken up um you know and then sometimes you'll put a pass in the perfect spot sometimes you'll miss by a little bit um those things will happen and especially in the small sample of you know, training camp practices with the quarterbacks throwing, you know, eight passes a day, you know, you're going to have good days and bad days, but the process is something that you can really look at and, you know, sort of see progress from the previous year and see a sign of what you're going to get in the future once the real games start. Um, so I think like you mentioned, sort of the timing on those, on those dropbacks is, is really important because I think last year you saw plenty of him, uh, especially early in the season, um, taking too long to get off that first read and kind of just not being, not having the timing with the way that he's supposed to get from one read to the next and allow the concept to work the way it's intended because he's too focused on that big play. And I, I do think you're seeing some good signs with that and, and with the limited, you know, clips that we could see so far from, you know, the fans who are at the open practices and then some of the highlights that have been shared. Um, so from the limited footage that we've been able to see, I think, you have seen better timing from him and just getting through those reads more fluidly and efficiently. Um, so I think that's a positive sign, but again, we'll see how that translates, especially in the preseason games and the joint practices um, more so than these, but I, I do think you're seeing some good progress there. And another thing that I think is important for me, which I think is especially key in a practice setting where you know things should be a little bit easier is just getting those, easy misses out of there because that was another early season problem last year where, you know, he was missing throws that should be completed 95% of the time. Plus um, screen passes, easy passes in the flat, just in the dirt. Um, and it seems like it's been mostly good. I think we have seen a couple reports of him maybe missing short on a couple shorter passes. Um, so it doesn't seem like he's been perfect in that area, but it, does seem like it hasn't been a consistent issue with him you know whiffing on easy passes which whereas you go back to last year I think there were a few practices by this point where you know the general consensus was he had he did have a pretty shaky day um, his accuracy wasn't that great whereas to this point I think you know again there have been some up and down days for sure but he hasn't had that day where it's like you know he couldn't complete a pass today he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. He hasn't had those. So I think that's a good thing. And again, with both of these, we'll see how it translates to the real thing. But, um, but yeah, I think the overall point is you want to look for, you want to look at the process, the fundamentals, and as far as we can tell with what's available and, you know, look for those transferable things more so than his completion percentage or the highlights that get shared um, that you can retweet and all that stuff. More so than that, I think you want to look at, you know, the mental processing, the, the fundamentals of the footwork and the timing of the drop and the release, the gang through the reads. As far as we can, you know, read that stuff, I think it's the most important thing to look at. And so far, it seems pretty good, I would say. Yeah, I think one of the other things you can, you can, you can take a look at uh, with these plays is, is he taking the easy completions? Because we right. saw that a lot last year where it's like, all right, he might have a tight end open in the flat maybe he only gets three or four yards but hell Corey davis is running 25 yards down the field and maybe i can squeeze it in between the corner and the safety and that sometimes got into to trouble with interceptions and a lot of times it just was incomplete and then it's like all right well if you just taken the tight end in the flat maybe he only gets three or four yards but maybe he shakes tackle and gets a first down either way you're moving uh the ball forward and it's it's positive yards and i think from reports it sounds like he's been a little bit better about that of just of moving the ball, just taking the easy completions, even if it means you don't take a, a chance downfield that maybe would have worked out. It's just about stacking those completions. Um, and one of the yeah, other things be before we move yeah. on. Yeah. I, I do agree that I think he's done well in that area. Cause you look at most of the, most of the plays that have been shared. And I know there was, you know, the big bomb to Elijah Moore 
Um, on the run, it looked like his pro day throw. There was that, but other than that, most of the clips and even the reports that I think we've seen have um, really most of them have been huge highlight throws. A lot there's been a lot of digs over the middle, comeback routes, corner routes, um, a lot of intermediate stuff. So I think that's really promising that he's hitting those throws. It, it, his appeal so far is more so based on you know that those bread and butter kind of throws than it has been. You know, look at these three huge highlight bombs he made, which, right. you know, those are nice, but if you're going to be a great oh, quarterback, hell, that, that one, you got to hit the, the bread and butter stuff. But that one, again, to Elijah Moore was great. Yeah. That one on Monday got me pretty excited when I, when I yeah. finally was driving back, got some cell service and I, I saw that one. I was like, all right, I know Elijah Moore is wide open, but the fact that he was able to just roll left and with the flick of a wrist, fly that thing, like 60 air yards. Yeah. For it's, it's just effortless distance from such an awkward that angle. That is why people should be excited about Zach Wilson, whether or not he hits that Mahomes like ceiling. There's only a few quarterbacks in the league that can do that. It's Mahomes, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert. Maybe there's a few other ones, um, but that's where you see the, okay, well, Aaron Rodgers, geez, can't forget Aaron Rodgers, but um, there's a few of them. It's a rare ability that, that fluid, whip like release to be able to throw from any platform and look like Elijah Moore is open. Um, but hell that's a touchdown. I mean, how many times have Mahomes done that to a wide open Tyree kill? I mean, you, that's nitpicking. Um, and we'll talk about Elijah Moore in a second. I think one other thing I just want to talk about with Zach, uh, because I heard Salah talk about this today or, or Wednesday. Uh, he was talking about like, you know, even on some of the days, you know, we said like he hasn't had any horrific days. I think Monday he had that big bomb and they didn't really do too much. And then Saturday he had like kind of a solid day, but was meh. Uh, especially in the red zone. That's what Saul was talking about. It was like he would have some good drives and then he'd hit a lull in the red zone because that's when everything is much faster. The field's condensed. He has to make those quicker decisions. Uh, and he, he thought he did a really nice job of that on Wednesday, his birthday, uh, especially uh, in those red zone periods. And I, that's huge because if you can't capitalize in the red zone, especially in situations like off of turnovers, which is something we've seen the Jets struggle with, constantly over the last decade it's how many times do they get a lucky break they get a fumble and interception even one that puts them you know in plus territory and they can't capitalize that they have to settle for three or hell sometimes they miss the kick or they go for fourth and they don't get it being able to capitalize in those situations is the difference between winning and losing and that's something i would really like to see zach wilson excel on and i think that's something you really can judge in training camp periods is is those red zone situations because they are you know realistic in, in my eyes um, I think that's pretty much all we have to say on Zach. I'm sure he'll come up in some of these other topics. Um, let's move on to just some camp winners from the first week. And again, I mean, take these with a grain of salt. It's hard to decide winners and losers off of a few practices. Uh, like you said, the joint practices will be huge, not just for Zach, but for the whole team to get a sense of where they're at. You know, the Giants ones are going to be chippy. The Falcons one is a team that they struggle with, especially defensively. They struggle with on both sides of the ball. Last year, same scheme, same systems. Those joint practices are going to be fascinating leading to the preseason game uh, on Monday Night Football, right? It's a, it's a primetime game, right? Yeah. All right, so we get we get one Monday Night Football game this year, and it's in August, so we'll take it. Um, so those are going to be absolutely crucial. But when we talk about winners, I think one of the things that I really do like about this training camp in general, and maybe it's just because we're so excited about this team, is even when – you know, Saturday's practice is a great example. Zach Wilson threw a pick six to DJ Reed. And like, obviously you don't want to see Zach throwing a pick six, but even watching that, I was like, damn, that gets me hyped. Great play by DJ Reed. You know what I mean? It's different than when you had Sam Darnold throwing a pick to like bless Austin or Pierre to see, or he's getting sacked. But you know, it's like at every level of this team, there's exciting young players. And if they make a play, even if it's on the defensive side of the ball, that's still something to be excited about. And I think that was one of the coolest things. And one of the biggest guys who's an example of that is the Jets' first pick in the draft, Sauce Gardner, who, uh, you know, our Jets x actors Robbie Sabo has pointed out, for a guy that big, and this isn't putting him in, in Canton just yet, for a guy that big, for his hips to be that fluid and his footwork to be that sharp, that's a rare special talent. And that's why he had the success he had at the Cincinnati. Now, is he going to get called for some holding penalties and defensive pass interferences this year and maybe throughout his career? Yes. But his size and athleticism and his technique uh, and his lower in his lower half is jaw dropping. And I think you saw him flash a few times, not just even with his athleticism, but with his, his play with his football IQ, which is something you can see young cornerbacks struggle with. What were your, your thoughts on, on whatever we heard from Sauce Gardner uh, in the first week? 
Oh yeah. He's, he's been really impressive. And I think that's one of those transcendent traits. I think what really makes players special is when they have an ability that they're not supposed to have, you know, based on their frame and right. their size and all that. And it seems like he does have that with his, just his quickness and his fluidity for, you know, he'll always have the strength and the length that, you know, comes with who he is being a six, three, 200 pound. I think he said 200. Um, but yeah, six, three long guy who is, you know, a hard hitter physical. He's always going to have that stuff, but you're not supposed to be smooth when you have those things. Usually it's, you know, as you get taller and you get longer, you sort of lose the quickness, but it doesn't really seem to be the case with him. And, and we knew that from his Cincinnati film, you, you could see it. Anyone who watched him, um, this is why he was a top five pick is because he's not just a tall, long guy. He's, he was a complete corner who could do it all. And, you know, to see it translate so quickly, at least based on reports and some of the clips who, um, that we've seen is, is definitely promising. And I think he's one of the biggest X factors for the team this year in the sense that, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting him to have some, some bumps this year. The Jets are going to play a lot of great receivers. He's going to be challenged, especially with DJ Reed, a, you know, a solid proven to an extent veteran. Um, he's going to be challenged and I'm expecting him to, you know, have some great games, but also some rough games. But if he can be a day one, you know, plus player, like if he, not necessarily to his ceiling yet, but if he could be um, even like three quarters to his ceiling as a rookie, like a Denzel Ward or Patrick Sertan kind of rookie season, then it could, it really lifts the ceiling of this defense and especially that secondary and the corner duo they could have with him and DJ Reed. So um, I think the, it's fair to expect he'll, he'll have an up and down rookie season. Darrell Revis was the same way. He didn't quite hit. He didn't become the Revis that we know until, you know, year two, he took a big leap and then he took another big leap in year three with that, obviously historic 2009 season. Um, so there can be a development curve right. for corners and that's what I'm expecting. But if he can, you know, just like Elijah Moore, we talked about consistency in training camp with him. He was consistently good. It translated. It seems like Gardner's kind of having a similar camp so far. Um, so if he can do that, which again, don't expect it, it's above the expectation, but if he can, it, it can really take this defense to an exciting level, but, but it's good just to see that he's, you know, acclimating well and just looks like he belongs so far. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you did say, and I was, I was going to stop you, but you, you said when you were talking about he's opposite DJ Reed and that might, I think having a guy like DJ Reed in the cornerback room is, is super beneficial for, for Sauce Gardner. I know that wasn't yeah. what you were, I know you weren't disagreeing with that, but I right. even, and the Jets play sides, uh, Gardner will play left, Reed will play right. Um, and, but just, having another guy who can go up against those number one receivers and so it, it takes a lot of pressure off of him uh, and so in my eyes I, I think that sauce is set up and is put, it has been put in the position to have a solid rookie season like you said you can't expect him to come out and be Darrell Rivas year one um, but I'm not expecting a Jeff Okuda type rookie season even just in the training camp clips of, of watching him cover Elijah Moore um, you could see the, the traits are there and he's had his moments uh, and honestly all, all the rookies um, you know, out of all of them, out of all the, the the primary four, we haven't heard too much of of Max Mitchell and Clemens, and I guess we could talk about them in a little bit. But between Sauce, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, especially, uh, and even Jermaine Johnson, who had a sack today and had a close one on Saturday, um, primarily the first three have all been major players in the first week of training camp. I've all seen, you know, I've read numerous tweets about all of them. It seems like Garrett Wilson is really fitting in, and Brees Hall seems like a guy that beat reporters are walking away. Um, and, you know, stashing him on their fantasy team because um, he's had a, a really nice start to tra training camp, especially when the pads have come on. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, Jermaine Johnson, out of the, the four of them has maybe been the, the least, uh, you know, have made the least plays. But again, you know, for uh, talking about corners having a development curve, defensive ends as young players always have a development curve. I mean, even the, the best edge players in the league today, you go to the rookie season, they didn't light the world on fire. They flashed, they got a sack, they had a few hurries, but they weren't the player they are today, not even close. Um, so that's okay, you know, and, and he still had a sack today. Um, but between all of them, between Brees Hall and, and Garrett Wilson, especially anything that jumps out to you and, and what they can bring to this offense, obviously we've talked about what they can bring 
the entire offseason, but just seeing him in the Jets helmet in these padded practices, does it give you any other perspective on, on what this Michael Floor offense can look like? Well, regarding Brees Hall, I think it's been promising to hear some reports of what he's doing in the passing game. I think yeah. that's that's definitely promising um, because the Jets can use that. It, it was a big weakness last year. Ty Johnson led all running backs in drops, and you just granted, 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 like four of them, four of them happened in like the a good game. chunk of them were in that Saints game. But um, but yeah, it, it's just something that you can't have for a young quarterback who, you know, when he's making, especially this quarterback in particular, who needs to learn to be a little bit safer with the football. You know, he needs to be rewarded when he checks the ball down. He's got to get that muscle memory and just you know that get it down in his brain that you know I can check the ball down and get good results out of it and when your running back is dropping every single check down it's gonna you know discourage you a little bit to check the ball down and obviously that Saints game just went straight downhill from there so that just showed that game just kind of showed you how much more they needed to improve in terms of the receiving ability at running back And, and Michael Carter brings a lot too but he does have you know some more limitations with pass blocking because of his size um, and and he did drop a decent number of balls as well last year, although he was good overall as a receiver. Um, so to improve that and have a guy in Brees Hall who could potentially upgrade that area quite a bit, in addition to what he does as a rusher, um, could be useful. And, you know, as opposed to edge rusher and corner, which we talked about, running back is a position where you can expect guys to contribute right away. That That's definitely, I would say, the number one position where you get rookie year production i mean their careers might even peak in year one year two year three um because it's just as that mileage um builds up that's as the running backs start that's when the running backs start to decline but there isn't as much of a growth curve as other positions so Brees hall is a guy who can help right away and it'll be interesting to see how much of an impact he can have uh, especially as he competes for touches and snaps against michael carter um, but what a duo that could be. Um, and yeah, for Jermaine yeah. Johnson, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, obviously, yeah, what a duo that can be. And and yeah. the thing that really excites me when, when you're talking about this is that yak ability that this offense has, which right, they didn't right. have last year. It's something they clearly prioritized. You could see with Uzama, who Sala called one of the best yak tight ends in the National Football League. Conklin, less so, but still is an athlete. And, you know, you can do a lot of fun things with him flexing out wide and, and whatnot. And, and he can make guys miss after the catch, but Uzama especially is really tough to bring down an open field. Obviously Brees Hall is Michael Carter. We saw that last year, one of the most elusive running backs I've ever seen in a Jets uniform. And the same goes for Garrett Wilson. And I know you're about to talk about Jermaine Johnson, but Garrett Wilson to me yeah. uh, is he, he's getting lost in the shuffle a little bit, even though he's made plenty of plays and it seems like he's sliding right in because receivers is a little hit and miss. Sometimes you have those Jamar chase type rookie seasons. And other times you have guys who are really quiet early on and then they, they, they come together. It seems like in recent years, receivers have been a, that position that's been able to come in, obviously running back, but has been able to come in and be a pro bowl a year one. And Garrett Wilson seems to be, you know, sound like an OTAs. He was still trying to get the playbook down the mental side of things down, but it sounds like now he's he's really fitting in and finding his groove uh, in this offense, and not just as a route runner, not just as a regular receiver, but his yak ability, and that ability combined with with uh, Elijah Moore and Corey Davis and Braxton Bears, all those guys can make move make guys miss after the catch, and that's so huge for this offense and so huge for a young quarterback who just needs to be hitting those completions. Yeah, and and just to bounce off what you said before getting back to Jermaine Johnson. Um, yeah, the yak potential for this offense is it's really through the roof. And it's, you know, that's what the Niners have been doing for years is trying to work off that after the catch ability. And obviously Debo Samuel is the poster child for that right now in that offense. But um, for years, that's what um, what Shanahan has been doing and, you know, trying to facilitate in that offense. George Kittle has been the best yak tight end in the league for years. And they've had you know, it's always been about those over the middle routes, giving playmakers chances to make plays um, and then, you know, getting them the ball on end arounds and then working off the thread of that and the pre-snap motion to create easy plays on screens and things like that. Um, and they have the plenty of playmakers to do it, like you mentioned. And like, these are guys who have proven they can do it too, which is exciting. Like CJ Uzama, one of the top yak tight ends last year, um, Elijah Moore, excellent yak last year 
Um, and then Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall were elite at it at college, and you hope they could translate it. Braxton Barrios, great job last year. So plenty of – oh, Mike Carter, obviously. Mm. Um, he's way – he was number one in, among all running backs in the league last year in terms of missed tackles forced per touch, and that combines both rushing and receiving. Um, so he brings it um, – just a ton of potential – with a yak, but, um, but yeah, to get back to Jermaine Johnson, um, I think it's been a nice start for him because he's, he, I think he's kind of shown you a little bit of what his rookie season might be like, yeah. because he, he has flashed with some big plays. He hasn't been silent. There have been, uh, I be- at least two sacks that have been on record for him. He had, he had one drills. sack, he had one sack on Wednesday and then he had a really near sack on Saturday, but Wednesday was his first sack, but he was really close to one on Saturday and maybe in a game situation, he would, would have gotten it. Right. So the, the flashes have been there in, even if he hasn't been consistently dominant, I, I think that's what we're going to see this year. Cause this is a guy who has, you know, fantastic speed. He has shown he has a great motor. So when you have those things, you're going to make, you're going to find the football and you're going to make length. some plays uh, the length too, which gives him a good tackle radius. Um, he's going to make plays, but does that necessarily mean he's going to be a consistent dominant force? Not necessarily because you still have to, have the technique and the finesse and the ability to win consistently to create consistent damage. And I think that is going to be the, um, the swing skill for him in terms of if he can figure that out, that's how he's going to be great. If not, maybe he won't be so great, but I think at the very least this year, you, you should see those occasional flashes. I, I see a low chance of him, being like you know Vernon Golston, where he doesn't do anything. Yeah. I, I find that very another unlikely. knock on wood, another knock on wood there. <laughs> right, um, but yeah, I, don't, I I don't think it's likely that he does absolutely nothing. Right. He's he's gonna make some big plays. It's just can he master his pass rushing uh, fundamentals to the point where he can be a consistent um, bringer of damage. Bringer of damage. I like that. Bringer name. of damage. I, I was, try, so I was trying to think of something, <laughs> and that's what came out. Bringer of damage. A bringer that's, of damage. You know what? We can. We're make just going to call him that from now on. Right, we won't bring, even say his name. We're not even going to say his name. The bring. I will. I think Robert Robert Hall referred to Jamie Sherwood as the Florham Park Strangler, right? Yeah. Okay. Which, so, all right. That gives me some hope that that Jamie yeah. Sherwood might have some something in the tank because we haven't heard his name too much. Um, I like that bringer of damage. Uh, there's a few probably stars a camp there's three of them here that we should talk about then we have a few more guys we'll, we'll touch on we'll get to the losers and a few other topics but you talk about jermaine johnson one of the things that gives me the most confidence that he can become that bringer of damage uh is that he's in a room with carl lawson and not just carl lawson Vinny curry and jacob martin and john Franklin myers and all these guys um Carl, to me, once the Pats came on, it seems like he turned into that that animal that we've been waiting for. It sounds like he got off to maybe a bit, a bit of a slower start to camp, wasn't doing too much, especially when Chuma Adogo was at left tackle. Uh, for some reason, it sounded like Adogo was doing all right, and then they put McDermott in as the, as the, the guy to replace Fant, who's just been getting battered by Carl Lawson um, from the you know from what it sounds like. Fant is, is working his way back in. It'll be interesting to see. Um, but, you know, Lawson was – uh, to the right side. I think he had a sack against Becton. He moves back to the left side. Um, once the pads have come on, it seems like Carl Lawson is that same animal. I'm very curious to see him in preseason and if he plays or, you know, obviously more so the regular season to see what type of player he looks like. And does he look any different after this injury? Sometimes it can be, you know, I, I've torn my Achilles, uh, but I was, you know, really young. It was like a surgery. So I don't have any like before or after, but I know it can be a process, you know, it's, and he is, he looks like an animal. It seems like he attacked this recovery um, with every fiber of his being, but it can be one of those things where maybe he's not really even feeling himself like himself until the end of the season. He didn't say that. Sounds like he felt sound, feels all good. And even if he's 80% of himself, he's still better than most edge rushers in this, in this league. I mean, that's just how damn good Carl Lawson is. And I don't think I'm overrating him uh, when you look at his pressure numbers and what he was able to do in training camp last year. He hasn't had maybe the sacks as some other guys, but when you look at what he's able to do on a consistent snap to snap basis, he's up there and he's in that upper echelon of, of, of edge rushers. How encouraging has it been to see what Carl Lawson has done, um, you know, early into training camp. And I don't want to get too into the loser section, but maybe to, to combine this, how worrying is it on the other side of that, where you have this amazing, like, all right, Carl Lawson is back. And they're like, Oh God, Oh no, our offensive tackles and offensive tackle yeah. depth is, is not looking that good. 
how do you balance that out? Uh, and but I guess more so start with how good does it feel to see Carl Lawson back on the field and dominating? Well, yeah, to start with Lawson, there's there's no doubt that he's been one of the one of the most positive stories so far. You know, he's pretty smoothly gotten back into the lineup. You know, started on the pup, quickly came off that slowly got more work and now he's just back out there dominating just like he was last camp um which is great to see and and you know pre-pads it doesn't really matter it's kind of hard to evaluate that but um pads came on and he's still he's still dominating i mean he was actually kind of quiet to start if i remember correctly but definitely since the pads came on um the noise has been there so that is it's really promising and it's so impressive how i mean this guy sustained not just this injury he's had multiple serious injuries throughout his football career and he just continues to bounce back and be an athletic specimen so it's it's very impressive what he's been able to pull off and we'll see how it translates but um for now it's been good to just to see him out there healthy and to to be playing well in addition to that and obviously on the other side of the coin whenever and this is one of those big training camp dilemmas is that you know, one player plays, makes a great play. That means someone on the other side didn't. Um, and, and I think that's another point of training camp evaluation is that like, even though from a results perspective, someone's always the victim, someone always made the play. It doesn't always mean both players played bad. Like if you have a, like the quarterback makes a great throw, it's well covered and the receiver makes a great catch, you know, that's an awesome all around moment. You had good coverage yet. Great. A great throw. And you had a great catch. Like you can get all that stuff in one. You could lose a play. And, still and, and sometimes, effort. and sometimes you want to see that, that corner make that play and knock it down. And it shouldn't be a knock on Zach Wilson. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Because there are, you can make a good throw. And sometimes, sometimes the defender makes a, a better play than the receiver. It can happen. Um, so those are the plays that you want to look for. Um, but in terms of, you know, Carl Lawson in the offensive line, some of these reps, it does seem like there has been some shaky play with the backups, specifically Connor McDermott, who's been singled <laughs> out quite frequently throughout camp so far. He's, pro- he's um, probably your, le- I mean, we don't have like least favorite players, but he sounds like right. you've been on the anti Connor McDermott fan club for, or hate club, I guess I should say, for the last year. And he's well, yeah. been around. <laughs> Joe Douglas loves him. He keeps talking. Every time he mentions the offensive line, he always shouts out Connor McDermott. He's not just some random backup scrub they have. Every time he talks about the offensive line, he's like, McDermott, tough guy. And it's just like, you know, every time he's been on the field, he's sucked. I mean, no, I mean, look, he's a professional athlete. I don't want to shout him too hard, but like, I don't know. It seems like Adogo is outperforming him. And who knows why they made that change to have him replace Adogo in practice. But Seems like every time he's on the field, he's he's getting beat like a drum. And I guess he's going up against Carl Lawson. So right. But but yeah, it's definitely I mean, last year he started two games and he was credited with giving up two sacks in each of those. Um, <laughs> he's been beaten up consistently this year. It's I'm, I'm not sure what he sees in him. And anyone who watches Joe Blewett's film reviews at JetX, one of my favorite kind of running jokes that he goes with is you know he'll be breaking down a college edge rusher's film and he'll say he'll he'll say something like you know this maybe this will work against a college tackle but it's not going to work against an nfl tackle unless it's Connor mcdermott so <laughs> so he's uh, maybe maybe he should switch to tight end let's just he, say that based on the catch he made against the jaguars that's true that's true i forgot about that i think he's just one of those physical specimens and they're just trying to if you want to call him that i mean he is a huge tackle with a great frame and he seems fairly athletic so i think they're just trying to take one of those guys and develop him and see if they can maybe and he seems like a high character guy and try to develop him in his technique and stuff but i'm sorry every time he's been on the field it's been a disaster and you don't want that guy protecting zach wilson to face your franchise's backside i don't care i I know they can find a better tackle than him Um, and i'm gonna say that and that's not just based off of one week of camp that's based off of an entire year plus of watching this guy play um and you know just talking about lawson and what he's been through with his body and he's had seasons where he stayed healthy but like you said this is a guy who has been injured throughout his entire career and hopefully that is something that you know hopefully he can get through 17 games this year and the way the Jets, I know you've been have you've heavily criticized it, but the you know the Ulbricht's philosophy of look, we want them to be able to sprint every single play. We basically need eight stars the defensive line because we're going to rotate these guys so much so that you know if like it's a first down, uh, you know on 
and they're on their own 20 or whatever, it doesn't really matter if Carl Lawson's out there, but if it's a third and eight with the game on the line, you want to make sure Carl Lawson's out there and fresh and ready to go and ready to make that play. Um, maybe that'll help him stay healthy. And it's one of the things uh, that it makes Aaron Donald so impressive is because when you have those physical, just athletic freaks, uh, especially those just guys who just have so much muscle mass on them. I see, feel like a lot of those guys are the guys who gets in, who get injury prone. It's almost like their body just can't take how strong they are and the force they're able to generate uh, and ligaments and tendons can tear and stuff like that. Aaron Donald's like missed like two games his entire career. So who knows with Lawson, hopefully, you know, some of the, the decisions they've made uh, with coaching and being deep at defensive line can help alleviate um, some of the stress and wear and tear he's putting on his body. Um, all right. Well, we want to fly through some of these because we have do have a few more things we want to talk about. And we don't this podcast be five hours long. Um, Elijah Moore, briefly. I know we talked about him a little bit. I have to say he looks a lot bigger this year. I think did he add like 10 pounds of muscle or something? Because he looks he looks he did. A uh, lot. He put out a tweet himself. Do you remember that? Where he said, uh, I think he put on, I think, 10 to 15 pounds. Okay, no, I didn't see that. My bad. Oh, uh, kind of. But I mean, you could just see it. I mean, you don't have to see a tweet. You could yeah, just there you go. Time. That's you know, that definitely proves that there's you know some proof to the pudding there he looks a lot bigger and i think that'll help help him stay healthy talk about staying healthy and stuff adding some size the one thing that i am excited not just to see how much bigger he looks it's going to make him stronger it might make him faster um you never know with muscle mass and stuff you just have to see him on the field but not only is he dominating but i like that the and i didn't expect lafleur to do this lafleur seems like a smart guy but i'm liking that they're not pigeonholing him into well this guy's a slot receiver he's clearly the jets number one receiver um, by all accounts, he is their number one receiver. And that doesn't mean he doesn't play slot a lot of the times and get those matchups where they think he can really dominate, but they're not afraid to put him at X or put him at Z. And I think that's the really cool thing about the receiver group that the Jets have is outside of Barrios and maybe outside of Mims, all these guys, well, okay, Jeff Smith might not be able to be an X, but all these guys can play <laughs> every single position. Davis can be an X, a Z, or a slot. Same goes for Garrett Wilson and Elijah Moore. You know, Mims is pretty much an X receiver, maybe a Z. Doesn't really seem like as much of a slot. Barrios is, seems strictly like a slot receiver. Maybe it could be a Z. But uh, it really opens up your entire offense. And I love, um, in the brief clips I've seen, you know, the matchups and the way that LaFleur is using Elijah Moore. I'm so excited to watch Elijah Moore uh, this season. Before we move on to our last superstar of week one, and then we have a few more smaller winners than the losers and some other topics. Thoughts on Elijah Moore? I mean, he is the way, he's a human highlight reel for for in terms of Jets uh, media coverage releasing clips for this team. It seems like every clip they release is an Elijah Moore touchdown or big catch or one handed grab. I mean, this guy's making a name for himself. For the for the broader fans that didn't really know who Elijah Moore was, NFL fans are about to find out real quick who Elijah Moore is. Yeah, for sure. And and like we mentioned, you know, last year it was a similar story. He was so consistently good, and now this year. He's just continuing that and really validating what he did in his rookie season and in his rookie training camp. Uh, and I just look back at that tweet, by the way, that he put up. He says he's 190 pounds now. Last year, he was listed at 178. So it seems like he put on about 12 pounds this offseason, which uh, should should be a nice boost for him um, as he you know tries to make those contested catches. Um, you know, I mean, he already was able to do that, but, um, you know, staying healthy too, like you mentioned should help, but, uh, but yeah, I think he has, he clearly has the ability to be the jets number one receiver and it's, you know, not something you typically see and, you know, guys of his size, but it doesn't seem to matter with this guy. You know, he can create separation from any alignment, any route concept. He showed that on his film last year, we saw him, we saw him do it all. And the size doesn't seem like much of a limitation. Um, he can make contested catches. He uses his verticality to do it. He high points the ball. He attacks it. Is verticality a word? Is, is verticality a word? I believe it is. Vertica isn't just his vert or his vertical? Verticality. I guess verticality would. I mean, I knew what you meant. I think it's a word. It's on the free dictionary.com. I guess so. that counts. All right. We'll, we'll go with it. Verticality. All right. So continuing and then we could talk more about the bringer of damage um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean he, he's a complete package he's a guy who i don't think needs to be pigeonholed or put into any specific role he, he can just do it all and i think the that's what makes the garrett wilson addition pretty cool is that garrett wilson's also a pretty versatile player so these guys can move around a lot 
and you know do different things it's not like elijah moore needs to play a certain role to accommodate his teammates strengths um they can all kind of move around and do different things and helps make the offense unpredictable so um i i'm looking forward to seeing what he can do this year it definitely seems like he'll establish himself as as the guy in this offense as much as one guy can be with with so many mouths to feed at tight end at running back and and at receiver um i don't think he's going to be you know a number one receiver to uh you know a jamar chase or justin jefferson sort of extent dominating the targets but i think he'll clearly be the the best pass catcher on the team Absolutely. And we've given out two gold stars, gold superstars for the first week of camp, loss and Elijah Moore. We have one more for Sam because I want to, you know, I don't want to give it out too early. We do have a few more winners I want to get to uh, briefly. Becton at right tackle seems like he's, is you know, the first few days, it seems like get back into football shape. That's not just losing weight and, and being strong. It's, you know, being able to be, a, you know, as, as Jeff Overk said, sprint for 60, 70 plays a game. Um, football is an extremely exhausting sport, especially for those guys down in the trenches and for a guy that size and for a guy who hasn't played in just about a year. First few days in that humid weather seemed kind of tough for him. Seems like he's finding his groove, especially on the right side. He's had some good days. He had that hilarious video <laughs> where he knocked John Benton on his ass with one arm, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty great. And then you pointed out in one of the, the plays that um, you know a fan filmed from, I think it was like Saturday or Tuesday or something like that. It might have been Tuesday. Um, Brees Hall breaking off a, a run and you see Becton come down a hill and as we've seen him do so many times in his young career put a defensive tackle or a linebacker or whatever on his ass it was Nathan Shepard um, just I, I'm so excited to watch um, every part of this team it gets me so excited yeah I remember in 2019 before I think it was before the season opener you were like I'm getting excitement attacks thinking about Le'Veon Bell and whatever you know <laughs> which is just so ridiculous in retrospect <laughs> but I feel that way about you could ta- talk to me about any position group and I'm excited about it, which is a rarity. I haven't had, and it's a legitimate excitement. Like I don't feel like there's a position group we're hyping up that doesn't deserve any sort of excitement. It doesn't mean that it'll come through, but that Becton next to Vera Tucker. And then you could run those plays where Tomlinson's polling. It's going to be fun stuff to watch. So Becton for me, um, I'm going to get to spit two more out and you can talk about these three. If, if you want to have anything else, then we'll give the final gold star. Corey Davis, another guy seems like he's slimmed down quite a bit, which is interesting. Curious to get your thoughts on how that might affect his, his play and, and why you think the jets had to do that. But um, it seems like he's been pretty consistent. I haven't seen anything about any of his drops. And I think Corey Davis is, is underrated by this fan base. I think he got too much hate last year. He obviously had some of the drops, but he's still a solid receiver. I mean, he, he just isn't, what maybe some fans and maybe us, maybe we were guilty of this made him out to be. He is a number two receiver. He's a Robin. He's not a Batman and that's okay. But you put Corey Davis next to an Elijah Moore and a Garrett Wilson. And I think you're going to see him, have, see him have a very productive season. Uh, he's had a good first week of camp. Uh, and then the last super, uh, the last winner, not the superstar Denzel Mims. How about that? Denzel Mims had a great first day was yep. quiet for a few yep. days. And then the last few days, he uh, not so much maybe today, but Tuesday and Monday, had some really good plays, including uh, I think he caught uh, what was it? It was like a crosser, and he took it sixty yards for a touchdown. Yep. Yep. Safety. So Denzel Mims, you know, if we're gonna shit on him when he's bad, I don't think we've chatted on him ever really that much, but gotta shout him out when he's good, making plays. <laughs> um, so there's three guys before we get to the last superstar camp: Becton, Davis, Mims. Any thoughts on those guys? Yeah, well, just I'll start with the receivers. Start with Corey Davis. Um, yeah, I think, I think like you said, he can be a really good Robin and he showed that in 2020 with the Titans. I mean, AJ Brown was the guy over there, but next to him, Corey Davis did about as, as well as you can expect a number two receiver to do averaging over 70 yards a game with very limited or not very limited targets, but you know, that's a lot more, that's a lot of yardage for the amount of targets he was getting. He was only getting about seven targets a game, but he's averaging 11 yards a target, catching 71% of his targets. You know, he was making the most of every target in that role. And I think, you know, last year we saw why that was happening. And that's because, you know, as a number one receiver, he struggled when teams threw man coverage at him with their best corner, whether it was, um, you know, JC Jackson with the Patriots game or Pat Sertan in the Broncos game. Um, Teams would, challenge him him being their top guy and the clear favorite of zach wilson's to that point and that's not really his forte the route running against man coverage but 
against uh, or when he was with the Titans and he was playing next to AJ Brown, who was attracting most of the attention. Um, then he gets to run against zone coverage, and that's where he's a lot better, finding those soft spots, breaking his routes at the right point, using his size to make contested catches over the middle. Uh, and then he has pretty good yak ability too, not the type of yak ability where you throw a screen to him, but you know, you know, catch a ball over the middle, break a tackle, get some extra yards, it's like the catch he made against the Panthers in the first week, uh, one against the Titans um, in the second quarter, I think. Um, so that's when you can really see him uh, make the most of his abilities when he doesn't have to win by himself and someone else is taking on that burden. So I think this year we could really see him be more efficient than he was last year. And then hopefully he, he gets, yeah, go ahead. Why do you think they had him lose the weight? Well, I think that does kind of make him a better fit for the offense. I think, you know, it probably adds a little more quickness to his game, a little more speed with the ball in his hands. Um, and, and like I said, the rounding against man coverage is what he struggled with last year. And, you know, maybe with, you know, less weight, he could be a little quicker, make sharper breaks, um, it probably makes him a better fit for the offense. But we'll see if it does take away from um, – because, you know, like whenever a guy makes these weight changes, you got to look at both sides of it. So, hope, yeah, maybe he'll be a little bit faster, but hopefully he doesn't lose some of the physicality that he has. He's also a good – run blocker for the position so hopefully he doesn't lose so that strength right. um right. but that's a good point we'll, we'll, we'll see how it works and hopefully it, he can um separate a little bit better um do better job yeah i, I always think of, i always think of marshall in 2015 how physical right. and big and strong he was and then they had him go on the top bulls diet uh in 2016 and he just wasn't the same player and maybe that was his natural age but he wasn't the same player and for Corey davis it wasn't like he was a pro bowler last year so I'm, I'm excited to see what it does. But as you said, I think the only concern I would have, because like physicality in this offense as a receiver isn't really a big, I mean, it's not like they have guys boxing out like Chan Gailey had a uh, Brandon Marshall be doing on the goal right. line. Um, but the run blocking will be something interesting. Anything on, on Mims or Becton uh, before I give it the last superstar camp? Oh yeah. First, first quick on Mims, I guess. Um, to this point, it's just good to see him being stable and consistent. Because last year, like we already said, he was the opposite of that. But now it seems like the coach is high. They're high on him and what he's doing. Um, he's been making plays fairly consistently. He's involved. So if there's any doubt about his roster spot, he's pretty quickly erasing that. Uh, he needs to carry it over to the preseason, I think. But um, but so far he's doing everything he needs to just to make the team. And he'll take it from there. We'll see what he does, if he can be a real contributor. But for now, he's doing his part just to just to, to make the roster and give himself another chance. Um, and then with Becton, you know, it's it's just good to see him back out there after the tumultuous offseason, just constant debate and all that. Just he's back out there. He's healthy. And it seems like he's doing a nice job. Um, he hasn't been called out for losing too much. I think I've seen at least one or two sacks that he's maybe given up. But, you know, this is a talented defensive front he is working his way back in after you know he's had a he's been recovering from the knee injury um and switching positions and switching positions um so you know it's to be expected but there have been some good run blocks that i've seen from him for sure and and there have been a few days where he did get a lot of praise uh for his pass protection and you know seeming to play better so just good to see him healthy and back out there um, and again, just like Carl Lawson and all these guys, hopefully it translates. Hopefully you can stay healthy. Um, but for now, just, just good to see them uh, just out there. Like I said, you know, because yeah, both those you guys. remember, you remember the whole off season that we had to go through just talking about Beckton constantly. He to see 77, the 77 Jersey out there throwing John Benton on the ground, like he's a <laughs> rag doll and just plowing. Like, Shit. You talk to me into the press. Line. Yeah. He's <laughs> like, just, yeah he's back it's good to see. yeah he had all that built up anger towards john benton for yeah for whatever reason um all right i have one more superstar camp who do you think it is well, let me think about this one all right i'll give up just um, is stall. it a player or is this like an outside it's player? a player no this is a real one this isn't like okay. even like a joking one okay um like so you can say like, like the black about- helmets or something and yeah, yeah the black helmets are those <laughs> superstar camp they haven't even worn them. I saw the Texans wear their, their red ones. So I wonder if the Jets will break them out of practice this summer at all. But um, we talked about the rookies. So it's not any of them. Oh, I've, uh, I've, 
Um, actually, there are two that come to mind. Okay. So can I say two? Sure. All right. Is it either DJ Reed or Quan Alexander? Quan was actually on the list and we forgot to talk about okay. it, but not as a superstar, just as a winner. Cause he came in and it seems like he's already getting starting reps. DJ Reed was not it. I, he could also be on the winner. He's had some good, good plays as well. Neither of them was a superstar. Quan though. Interesting. Just 10 second sidebar. Uh, interesting that he came in, they thought they're going to have to ramp him up and he was already in football shape and he's already getting reps next to CJ Mosley, which is great. It gives the jets. We'll see how it works with the, the, the four, three front with, him, Quincy, and CJ playing alongside each other, but it's great to see Quan having a great camp considering that was a very weak position. But no, last superstar camp for the first week of camp, Quinn and Williams, who Ooh, the last few days is really, and the camp as a, as a whole, you know, this is a contract here for Quinn. He's been a, a very good player, especially 2020, borderline great player. And last year, you know, he missed all of OTAs and most of training camp battling. But did he, what, did he, what did he do? He broke his foot or something? Or he, think so yeah or ankle or something like that he was injured new system you know when you get injured like that it's not just all right now the foot's healthy and i can go it's like you can't lift weights so your legs aren't as strong you're not as conditioned you know you're just not the same player um you can't train um so that threw them all off last offseason i firmly do believe that and then you know he still had a good season he still had six sacks but he didn't take that you know, 2019 was maybe an underwhelming rookie year. 2020 was a great step. It was a, something we weren't expecting. For me personally, I was like, I don't know if this guy's going to be amazing. Great step, 2020. And last year was like eh, kind of plateau, maybe a little worse. Where I was hoping you could you'd see him take the like a Chris Jones type of leap. Ignore Aaron Donald. That guy's for his position, probably the best player in the league, you know, in terms of gap between him and everybody else at his position. So ignore Aaron Donald. But like, could he get close to a Chris Jones level? And I didn't really feel like he did that. He's more like at a Leonard Williams level, like Jets Leonard Williams level. But he needs a big year. The Jets are going to pay him, especially with all the young players in the pipeline. Quinnen is the last first-round draft pick that Joe Douglas didn't draft, so he can walk away from him. They have plenty of talent on this defensive line. I have no doubt they could go and find a, a great defensive tackle. But it's a big year for Quinnen. He's going to be playing more of that fully fought Akasi role, but he's still going to have pass rushing opportunities. And for the first week of camp, it seems like he's done a really good job of, of cementing himself to say, I'm not just a good player. I could be an excellent player in this league. And he's doing it not against a bunch of scrubs. He's doing it against one of the best interior trios that you'll find across the National Football League. So I'm incredibly intrigued with Quentin Williams' first week of camp. We'll see if that translates to the joint practices, see if that translates to preseason games in the regular season. But one week in, Lawson, Elijah Moore, Quentin Williams, so uh, gold stars, in, in my opinion. Uh, any thoughts on, on Quinn's first week of camp? And I'm surprised you didn't guess him. I thought that was a, I mean, the Quan and DJ were, were solid guesses, but superstar, come on. Quinn Williams had a great first week of camp from what I've read. Yeah, it was definitely a great pick. I mean, um, I, and to go back to what you just said about, you know, who he's going up against making these plays. I think that's one of the cool things about this training camp for the Jets is that uh, the, for the most part, the plays that are being made, you can, sort of look at the other side and, and be like, okay, he's doing that against a good player versus, you know, previous seasons where it's like, you know, the Jets defense plays well and you're like, oh, that's against the Jets offensive line. That's against Brian Winters. That's against um, whatever other scrub offensive lineman they've had that I forget about. Um, you know, it was, you know, sometimes there would be that asterisk where it's like, well, we have to acknowledge the Jets aren't that good. So is it that impressive that you're making this play? But then this year, you know, the defensive line is doing it against Lake and Tomlinson, who's uh, not that I'm not that these guys specifically are being singled out for giving up plays, but just in general, you know, you know, there's a pro bowler in Lake and Tomlinson, Connor McGovern, a longtime starter who's been pretty solid. George Fan, who was good last year, Becton, who's obviously talented. You know, these are good players. And then you look at the skill position players, Elijah Moore good rookie season last year. Garrett Wilson, top 10 pick. So just across the roster, the fact that there's all this legitimate talent. And then defensively, you know, you make a play on DJ Reed. That's impressive. The guy was very good, a very good NFL starter last year. Um, Quan, Exal Quan Alexander, experienced NFL pro, CJ Mosley, same thing. So just across the roster, it's like, you know, most of the plays that are being made, you can – you know, look at it and see it as valid because it's against a, a good, I you know, either a talented, highly drafted player or a, 
a, a starter that's you know proved his worth in the league versus previous seasons where you know there there were big enough holes on the roster to where it's kind of hard to evaluate other positions because the competition was so weak. So I, th- I think that's one of the cool things about the roster this year. But but yeah, with Quinn Williams, uh, Sheldon Rankins kind of had a really cool quote about him where he, you know, he said he was talking to John Franklin Myers and they agreed that, or at least Rankins pointed out that it's the best that Quinnen's looked so far, in, at least in the time that he's been there. Um, so that's encouraging to hear. He's like you said, maybe going to be a little bit different of a role this year, maybe more snaps uh, further on the interior, like one tech two I tech, you know, controlling that run defense. Uh, he's going to be huge in the run game. He's pretty much, I, I guess you can call him like the captain of the run defense in terms of who's going to have the biggest impact right. because, you know, if he can be a superstar run defender, it could cover up a lot of some of the other holes they're going to have. Um, and he's definitely capable of being that he uh, led interior D lineman in run stops per game in 2020 took a little bit of a dip last year. So he's capable of being that. And then hopefully he can get the pass rushing as well. And, you know, he has the technique and the quickness to do it just got to be more consistent because they'll have great games. Then he'll have stretches of a few quiet games. Got to get that consistency, but the flashes of dominance, they have been there. So big season coming up for him, especially with the contract situation looming. Yeah, and another guy who reportedly is in the best shape of his life. And you hear that maybe every offseason, but I really do believe that this staff has put such an emphasis on these players as individuals and that all gas, no break mentality that, you know, waking up better than when you went to bed. And I think that really has run true with a lot of these players. You know, I, I you haven't heard much about that with, with Bowles and Gase. And, you know, maybe that that was being said, but it wasn't as at the forefront of their message as a team of, you know, you as an individual need to do everything possible um, for us to have any sort of success. Um, and I think you've seen that, uh, you know, Zach adding the weight, Quinnen, Becton showing up in shape, Elijah Moore adding weight. A lot of these guys have shown up in quote unquote, the best shape of their life. CJ Mosley last year, you know, completely transforming his body. Um, so that's encouraging. And you'll see those headlines every year, but I think specifically with this coaching staff, they've done a good job at inspiring these players to want um, to, to be the best versions of themselves. It's not just the coaching staff. It also goes, this is why you need to have the front office and coaching staff speaking the same language because it goes right back to the front office, drafting and bringing in high character guys. And I know Quinton wasn't a, a Joe Douglas guy, but I think, you know, either way, I think you can qualify him as a high character guy. Um, and it, and it, it's, it's paying dividends and maybe not yet in the win and loss columns, but we'll see come, uh, come the season. Um, but certainly in August, you can see, the message that this coaching staff has preached uh, is ringing true with its players. Um, so that's encouraging. Let's do some losers and not as long, hard to pick losers because the real losers, a lot of the times are the guys we haven't really heard from. So you kind of have to guess. And as you said, you know, sometimes a guy loses a play, but maybe he did well. So you don't want to nitpick too much. And it's when we could camp. A lot of the winners could turn out to be losers by December. Who knows? Um, let's talk O-line depth, obviously. I, I don't even really think depth as a whole. It's really offensive tackle depth because and we'll see this more in the joint practices and the preseason games, but it sounds like, you know, like Dan Feeney filled in and, and looked pretty good as a, as a backup center last year. Nate Herbig is, in my opinion, probably got to be one of the better backup guards in the league. I feel like he could start some places uh, who we claim from uh, Philadelphia uh, in like May or something. Uh, but when you look at the offensive tackle depth, it sounded like Adoga was having a solid start to camp. Don't know what the story really is there. I know he's still getting reps. Haven't heard anything from Max Mitchell, which maybe is a good thing. I don't, you know, I don't really know. It definitely it seems prob- like a position. Maybe good, I, I would say. That's true. I guess for offensive linemen, if you haven't heard him, it's a good thing. Um, so I, I imagine they're going to sign somebody. I mean, because right now you go with Fant, Becton, Mitchell as locks. And I think right now Adoga would make it. But I have a feeling that unless Adoga just balls out in training camp and preseason, they're like, all right, we're comfortable with this group. I think they'll go ahead and sign somebody. Um, But, yeah, the chances that Fant and Becton play all 17 games are slim. So that's a position that that concerns me. And right now the only position that I really feel any sort of concern about um other losers unless you have anything you want to add on offensive line just because trying to speed this this part up but any anything you want to add there uh, i think that nails yeah. it for the most part yeah <laughs> i mean i guess I, i'd throw in jeff smith for receivers maybe just yeah, because, yeah yeah um 
you know, not necessarily because I guess that he's been playing bad, but just with Denzel Mims having a nice camp so far, it doesn't bode too well for Smith. But I think Smith should still be good, but uh, maybe uh, Mims has just gained some ground on him in that race. Right, and offensive line uh, and specifically tap, tackle depth will get a better sense on the joint practices because clearly the Jets have one of the better defensive line units and edge units and deepest edge units in the league. So, you know, get a better sense for that stuff. Like you said with Jeff Smith, some of the losers is just like circumstance. Did a guy come in and play really well? I know Zonovan Knight had sounded like he was having kind of a solid start to the camp and maybe you're thinking, oh, if you're Tevin Coleman or Ty Johnson, in trouble. I think Knight can probably stick around in the practice squad, but between Ty Johnson and Tevin Coleman right now, fighting for that third running back spot, Coleman hasn't been playing. Technically, he's a loser. And, and you know, not that it's, it's, I think he has a non-football injury. Ty Johnson has got the, the head start on him. I don't know if Ty Johnson's necessarily taken full advantage of it. That'd be one of those things where you'd want to be at practice to really observe that. Again, preseason will answer a lot of these questions. Um, I guess another one you could go with is Vinny Curry, who's another guy who hasn't really been able to practice yeah. too much and a really deep unit. And there are guys like, you know, Bryce Huff had a really great start to camp and I could have even thrown him into the winner's circle. He hasn't done too much the last few days, um, but a really great start to camp. And it's like, they, they, they said it themselves, they want eight starters. And so I don't see Vinny Curry getting cut, but it's like, you know, if, if a guy like Hamilcar Rashid or Bradley Ane or one of those guys just starts to make a lot of noise and you're like, or even at defensive tackle, if, if it's like we, Jonathan Marshall's doing a lot, but we still want to keep Nathan Shepard. And obviously we're keeping Rankins and Solomon Thomas. We got to cut somebody. I could see Vinny Curry being that guy. So he's another guy you could put in the loser category. Clemens, I again don't read too much into this. Just we haven't heard him. It's the only reason I really threw him in there. He looks like a freaking Cyclops beast when he's walking onto the onto the field. And as we said, defensive linemen can take longer to develop. The only thing with him is he's 25 already. So he doesn't necessarily have the same you, fan base can't have the same amount of patience with him as you would with other players, but it's his rookie season training camp one weekend. And he, look, hell, he might still be holding his own, you know, having a good camp, you know. But we haven't, it's not like he's blown it up. So it's a deep unit. So we'll throw him in here for now. And then the last one, and if any of these, well, there's two more. One most important one, most important loser of camp so far, I would say outside of maybe the offensive line depth, Eddie Pinheiro. Yeah. Sounds like Pinheiro and Zerline going back and forth pretty close. Zerline didn't kick today. Pinheiro did. Missed a few. He's missed a few the last few days. It seems like Zerline has edged him out so far in camp. Again, preseason games will be huge for these guys. And kickers normally shake free. So if none of, if both of them suck, uh, once again, the Jets might be adding a kicker right before the season starts. Um, thoughts on Pinheiro? Oh, one more. And then you can give your thoughts on any of these guys that you have to say, anything to say on. You mentioned to me, you, you thought that LaMarcus Joyner might have been uh, maybe at fault, just maybe in the area at a few of these uh, big plays the offense has had. And, and you know, Pinnock is, is a guy that I really like and might be nipping at the, at the bud. Sounds like the staff really likes Joyner, but Joyner's a guy who's getting up there in age, a year off. His last few years before coming to New York last year weren't that great. Granted, he was playing more slot corner, so maybe a guy to keep an eye on because as great as this, this secondary is, Joyner's not really holding up his end of the 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 uh, the level of performance that the Jets want to uphold. I could see him getting swapped out for for Jason Pinnock real quick. Um, so, any thoughts on those guys? Yeah, Pinero definitely. I mean, he was my pick slash preference to win the kicker battle just because I felt like he brought a little more uh, reliability than Zerline, who's more known as a power guy. But, um, but yeah, Zerline has a little bit of an edge developing here. Panero missed two very short ones a couple of days ago. I think they were 28 and 34 yards. So pretty much gimme kicks a couple that he missed. Um, Zerline missed one as well. But, um, but then Panero the next day, uh, like you said, Zerline didn't kick, but uh, Panero kicked and he missed a 55 yarder. Uh, so the misses adding up for Panero, not a, not a good start for him. Uh, preseason, he's gonna have to turn it around. Uh, and then Joiner, um, like you know, we don't get all the film of practice, but the the few clips that are out there, there are some plays in which Joiner looks a, a little bit guilty. There was uh, one red zone touchdown I saw Wilson throw to to Jeff Smith actually. Um, or was it Jeff Smith? I believe it was Jeff Smith, but um, but Joyner didn't do a good job of giving Mosley help over the top. He's kind of uh, got caught up uh, looking at another receiver when he should have been helping out. And then there was the 
touchdown or bomb that Zach Wilson threw to Elijah Moore. Um, and you can't see the whole play, so it's not fair to judge him really. But, you know, Joyner did look kind of guilty in that one. He was chasing down more from behind. Everyone else was covered. So that was a little suspect. But um, this is probably – this could be nitpicking a little bit, but he definitely has – stood out as a culprit a few times within what is available for us to watch. Yeah. And again, can't overreact to the losers, just like you can't overreact to the winners. I think the winners are easier to find than the losers because the winners, the guys making big plays. And so it's, it's more tangible than the losers. The losers will pop up a lot more, as I've said, like six times throughout this podcast uh, in the joint practices and the preseason games. Um, one more thing before we get out of here. And it was a topic that I was considering just bumping to we're going to be back on Monday because we want to stick to that Monday schedule. Obviously I was uh, out of town for the last few days. So we couldn't do it. We're like, all right, we should do a podcast. It's perfect timing. Jets don't have practice today. This is coming out Thursday. We'll do a quick recap in the first week. They'll have, I think they have like a quick practice Friday morning. And then Saturday is the green and white scrimmage. Then they'll be off Sunday and we can do a, a mailbag podcast and we'll be back on Monday with the, the whole, you know, back on schedule. So I was thinking of saving this until then, but I thought if we didn't address this based off the first week of performances, one of the bigger stories isn't, you know, actually, I shouldn't even say bigger stories. One of the storyline I've been watching is the performance of Joe Flacco, who I think is, probably been the most consistent quarterback i think you could say uh, there's no chance there's no quarterback controversy i know i saw that stupid tweet where there's like joe flacco's outperforming zach wilson it's like not necessarily just joe flacco's a veteran he's got a great feel for this offense he's he moves it um well up and down the field well he takes those easy completions he's more decisive he plays within the timing of the offense but the hope of zach is that you can get him to establish more of those traits so that his natural athletic gifts that he has you know significant advantages over Joe Flacco can really shine. Um, but with Joe Flacco, great problem to have. You have a, a really competent backup and one of the better backups in the league. And I like that he had a year of last year. He got a game. So he's not like he's learning the system right now. Uh, and not only does he give you that, but he also gives you somebody that Zach can really bounce off of and, and talk to. And I think that was something that helped him last year. And uh, something they ignored uh, the previous year to bring in a veteran that could help him. Um this year they've minimized the voices, but Flacco is one of those that I think the Jets want to keep around. Um, Zach Wilson. That was never in doubt. Obviously, Joe Flacco is, is going to be the backup. This leads me to Mike White. And Michael and I were talking about this on Saturday, right before I lost cell service. We were talking, and I was like, I don't think Mike White's going to make this team. Even if he has a good training camp, can you see the Jets keep in three quarterbacks? I don't know if they have the luxury to do so because they have a lot of, you know, they have a deeper team than they've had in years past. And they have some guys, a lot of young players, guys are going to have to stash guys like Michael Clemens or Max Mitchell or Jeremy. Actually, I think Jeremy Rucker will play, but guys who are young, who they're obviously going to keep, but might not be contributing too much on game days. Um, not to mention a lot of talented players that are ba battling for spots. And Mike White is a guy who before that Bengals game, he could have been cut in November. And nobody would have really cared. You know, he didn't really have a huge name. I think he, he outperformed Luke or, uh, James Morgan in preseason, but outside of that, it wasn't like he was balling throughout all training camp. He had that amazing Bengals game. He had a great start to the Colts game, gets injured, and then he had a pretty bad Bills game. But again, you know, going out against the best team in the league with you know not too much random. It was a bad game for everybody. Um, and it leads us to now where it's like, Michael, do you see a scenario where Mike White sticks? I mean, it's possible if they want to keep three quarterbacks, but it, it's going to cost them a, a tight end or a six receiver or a Justin Hardy or an extra defensive lineman or something. And for a team like the Jets, it makes doesn't it make more sense to just have your Zach Wilson and you have Joe Flacco and then you have another quarterback you can stash in your practice squad. Um, who's the guy that they, they brought in a fourth quarterback specifically for this scenario where if they do cut Mike White, they have a guy who they get a, they get a chance to look at um, I know you're pulling up his name because I can't remember it right now, but they get a chance to look at takes reps, learns the offense. If he impresses, you can stash him on the practice squad. Um, Michael, you have his name, Chris Striebler. Chris oh, doesn't sound like a winner. No, offense. no. Chris Striebler. I had, I had to look it up. So, I mean, to be fair, Mahwat <laughs> did not sound like a, a Super Bowl or 400 yard <laughs> Hall of Fame quarterback either, but yeah. um, I just I don't see Mike quite make it. And I know what's going to happen is he's going to get cut. All the Jets fans are going to overreact and have that pit in their stomach says, we're going to let this guy go. He's going to go somewhere else. He's going to turn into this Hall of Fame quarterback. And 
it's only happened that the chances that happens are, are very slim, but I, he will get claimed. There's a chance that they could maybe sneak him through waivers and stash him on the practice squad. Maybe, but probably if he gets cut, there's he, he just based off that Bengals game, hell, even the Bengals could claim him. Just there's, there's a team out there that either has, you know, isn't in the position that has the luxury of keeping three quarterbacks um, or just doesn't really feel that great about their backup quarterback. And it's like, why don't we give this guy a shot? He looked great. There's plenty of teams that run similar offenses that saw him operate the offenses smoothly. I mean, what are your thoughts on the whole Mike White situation? I think I'm just with the way Joe Flacco played the first week of camp. If, if Flacco was in why we're even, I could say, Hey, let's just cut bait with Flacco and stick with white. But Flacco is far. Is that a very solid first week of camp? I would even say a good first week of camp. Mike White has had his moments as well, but it's just like, that scenario is coming down the pipeline. What do you think, Michael? Do you, do you think that there's a chance Mike White sticks in this team? Do you think it's more likely he gets cut? What do you think about that? And is there a chance he can stash him on the practice squad? Just your whole thought. Let's just put this out of the ether so Jets fans aren't blown off their seats if he gets cut at the end of training camp. No, oh, I'm, I'm totally with you, I think. It's it's the most likely possibility, I think, when you break it down. Um, like you said, Joe Flacco's kind of um, – he's put an early stranglehold on the backup quarterback job. And, and a big factor in this too, is you have to remember that he has a decent chunk of guaranteed money. I think 2.8 million, whereas white has none being a restricted free agent who they brought back on a tender. So for white to take over that backup quarterback job and force the jets to either, you know, keep Flacco as the third quarterback or most likely cut him, he'd have to significantly outplay him to make them, uh, be willing to eat that dead money for Flacco. So Flacco's got a backup quarterback locked up. I think that's pretty clear, barring a catastrophic preseason. So that's in stone. And it comes down to, do you want to keep three quarterbacks? And I think in previous seasons, maybe it's something you'd be okay with. But looking at this Jets team and just how much deeper it is than, than usual, i uh, I think you lean towards keeping someone else instead of Mike White and you break down some of the bubble players that, you know, you might want to keep. And, you know, would you rather keep a third string quarterback instead of a Justin Hardy who can lead your special teams or a Vinnie Curry who could really help your situational pass rush or, and fourth, bring, tight end. or fourth tight end. Um, you know, there's a lot of options, you know, good solid players or young prospects like, um, I don't think Denzel Mims is getting cut, but you know, someone in that receiver competition or, you know, Zonovan Knight, um, there, there is legitimate. They could talent. probably, they could probably stash Knight on the practice squad, but yeah, maybe, maybe but yeah, just depending on how he, he plays in the preseason. Right. Um, but yeah, bottom line is I think there, there's enough legitimate talent on this team to where a third string quarterback isn't worth the roster spot. And I think you want to win this year. You want to help your franchise quarterback. Uh, if, if your third string quarterbacks ever playing, it's a disaster anyway. And it's also not like they're in a spot where, you know, that third string quarterback is a developmental piece because another key part of white's future is that he's an unrestricted free agent after the season. So he's no longer the type of player where it's like, you know, let's develop him to be the long-term backup because you don't have control over him anymore. If you know, he, he's a free agent after this year, he can go wherever he wants. He's probably going to go somewhere where he's not blocked by a franchise quarterback, you know, has a chance to potentially compete. Potential um, franchise quarterback. Right. Potential franchise court franchise quarterback in the sense that it's his job right. until, you know, he loses it. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, you know, he's not a long-term piece because he's an impending free agent and you already have your guy at that position. Hopefully uh, he's not a short-term piece because third string quarterback I think you're screwed anyway if you get to that point um and yeah like hopefully best case scenario he gets waived you can put him on the practice squad take advantage of the rules where you know you have a little more flexibility with you know calling him up and being able to use them like they did with Josh Johnson last year um hopefully that happens but I think there's enough appeal with him that he's probably going to get claimed just off of that Bengals game uh, like you said, maybe even the Bengals themselves. Um, someone's going to buy into that, I think, if he gets waived and give him a shot. Because this is quarterback. It's not like any other position you have one great game like that. That's probably not enough. But at quarterback, 
I think a team against a team that went, against that. the team that went to the Super Bowl, by the way. Right. It was, it was a highly publicized game. And right. I think it, he definitely earned a lot of fans around the league for that. So I think if he gets waived, he most likely gets claimed. I don't think he stays in the roster because just not enough short or long term value to it. And it's too deep of a roster to where you're going to lose someone that you're actually going to feel bad about losing versus right. previous seasons. So most likely I think uh, Mike white is coming. The Mike white era is coming to an end. Probably. And you know, looking at how you have to also have to wonder like how much of this is just, you know, it's a system that's based on if the quarterback can make the, the reads quickly and, and look, I'm making it, I don't want to dumb it down and make it sound simple, but it's not like Mike white is a athletic freak who was doing it. It's like Mike white was a guy who was, as I said, could have been cut before the season. If you told me that he got cut in training camp, nobody would have cared. It was just that one game and the start to the Colts right. game that really changed the the opinion with him. To me, I think the best case scenario for the Jets is probably that. Because as you said, like, look, if he plays, it means Zach Wilson's not doing that well or he got injured. It's just, it's a nightmare scenario. And it's like, you can't control him after this year. So it's like, then you're saying if he really balls out and you want to keep him, then it's like, all right, well, now we're going to, try to maybe trade Zach Wilson and keep Mike. It's a whole sloppy timeline. And right now the jets are all in on Zach Wilson. So here's what I think will happen. I maybe I shouldn't say a thing. Well, you know what? I'm going to go out hot take. Here we go. Here's my prediction. And it's something we didn't necessarily talk about. I think Mike white will have a solid preseason. I think he'll play good enough where somebody will trade a day three pick for him. And I think the jets will trade. Yeah, for that's, a that's a possibility too. the, the trade as well. And then when you look at it like that, it's like Joe Douglas signed this, this random quarterback from Western Kentucky, undrafted free agent, and was able to flip him for, you know, maybe they get a six, a conditional fifth or four, whatever. They get a fourth for Chris Herndon. So maybe who knows what he could do with Mike White. Maybe there's a few teams, three, three teams that want him or a team that's way down in the claim order that wants a shot of him. And, well, you know, maybe they'll ship a fourth for him. Who knows? Who knows what could happen? But I think Mike White isn't on this team, and I think it's because he gets traded. Um, if he has a, if he has a bad preseason, maybe the jets can cut him and sign him back to their practice squad. If he has a great preseason, I think he gets traded. And if he has a solid preseason where it's like, you're not going to, nobody wants to trade for him, but if you cut him, somebody will sign him. That's probably the worst case scenario. You kind of either want him to, well, but then if he balls out and I don't know, I think what ultimately happens is he has a good enough preseason where somebody trades him and they get a day three pick and you can talk about a return on investment and hope that he doesn't turn into the second coming of Tom Brady, or even hope like, all right, even if he's a really good starting quarterback, a Kirk Cousins type quarterback, that Zach Wilson takes his leave. Um, anyways, I thought that was something interesting that I was thinking about after the first week of like Flacco's looking real good, looking at this 53 man Ross prediction. It's like, I don't know if Mike White sticks. That's, that's a valuable roster spot at the, at the bottom of, of, of the roster. So with that being said, Michael, I think that's a good, wrap up of the first week of training camp um you can follow us at tyj pod on twitter myself at ben w blessington michael michael underscore nania go to jets x factor for the best place to go for jets content i think that's it as i said we'll be back on monday they got the green and white scrimmage on saturday looking forward to that as you said you just want to see a solid performance from zach that's really all i'm looking for and some and some good plays and not no injuries knock on wood again uh, um michael any last thoughts before we wrap this up no i mean the whole off season just gone by pretty quickly once once training camp gets here every everything moves really fast it's just you know after months of nothing it's just training camp for a couple of weeks uh well obviously it keeps running but a couple of weeks of training camp practices then you know preseason game or well first scrimmage then preseason games joint practices preseason's over season's on um so so yeah i can't wait for preseason next week and the scrimmage this weekend um but uh, but once the preseason games get here, I'm most looking forward to watching watching the young players and the draft picks, uh, the, the hall of draft picks that they just brought in. You know, Gardner, Paul, Wilson, the bringer of damage, the whole crew. Very excited. Yeah, absolutely. And how much do you live for those training camp tweets, by the way? I mean, I have to say it. There's nothing like my, it. I, I'm not. Uh, my day is sort of built around them. Not gonna lie. <laughs> I, know, there's nothing just, like. Hey, there's no shame in that. There's no shame you in. You know, once ten fifteen rolls around, it's like, all right, gotta be, gotta be on the computer. Well, hey, well, hey it is your job. Fresh. It is your job. Yes. It's not yeah, that. It's a little, little bit different for me. So, um, but uh, but yeah, it's like ten fifteen. It's like you know, Robbie's always got his tweets as well, and I'm chatting with him too on it, what he's seeing. You're basically practicing. 
you're basically practicing. You're one step away. I'm just kidding. But, you know, 10, 15 rolls around, you got to be ready. You got to be up ready with those Twitter fingers. But, uh, no, it's great. I love I love getting those tweets. Just like Zach Wilson, 20-yard dime down the scene to Kyle, Tyler Conklin. It's just like mm, every time. And then it's like – then he's the bad ones. It's like intercepted. But the good part about these is like if it's like intercepted by Sauce Gardner, it's like, all right, I can get excited about that. So Right. But then uh, if it's intercepted by – JT, joiner whatever Hassel? just some random guy yeah is jt Hassel um, still let me look at i was gonna say jt Hassel. that's just came to mind though yeah uh, who's it, I, i'm looking at the roster who's a pretty random guy right now luck bark let's play you know who that is i don't know who that is. i thought it was luke Mug. luke okay luke luke bark was luke yeah okay. uh, all right well i don't know who it is but yeah there are a few players that if you got picked off by i'd be kind of mad but who knows with that said, Michael, time for us to get out of here. We'll be back on Monday with the mailbag. So we'll put out a tweet for that uh, probably Saturday after Green and White scrimmage. Look, be on the lookout for that. Thank you to everybody for – or probably Sunday. Uh, thank you to everybody for, for listening. Um, good first week of training camp in the books. Excited about that. Knock on wood. No injuries. Keep the, Let's keep this train rolling all the way through preseason games, all the way to the regular season. Exciting times. Thanks for listening. Go Jets.